Hey guys, Violet here. Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Art. If you are already a part of this true crime family, welcome back. If you're new here, go ahead and hit subscribe so you don't miss out on all the fun. And if you're wondering what we do, well, um, I tell you a true crime story and I paint something that hopefully you find interesting. So it's a lot of fun. Again, hit subscribe, uh, like the video on your way out, whatever floats your boat. It certainly helps me, it helps you, it's all a good thing. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, we are talking about the really intense and crazy story of Sharon Kinney. Now, Sharon was born in November of 1939 to uh, Eugene, to, sorry, to Eugene and Doris Hall. And it was said that she had a good childhood. So, you know, most of the time, whenever we talk about these stories, they're like, crazy and, and have a horrible childhood, but uh, Sharon, all, all the research that I could find said that she had a really great one growing up. There was one article that said that she was raised by a single alcoholic mother, but she lived with her mom and her dad, so uh, I don't know. It was 1939, so maybe the facts are hard to come by. Who knows? Anywho, when Sharon was 15... She, oh, sorry about that, guys. She met a man named James Kinney, and they met at a church function. Now, they, she was obviously a lot, a lot younger than James, but they started dating. It was during the summer. It was a really intense summer romance, and by the time August came back, James had to go back to school at BYU, so he heads back to school. Well, Sharon wants to get out of this little small town that she was raised in. And so she calls James and tells him that she's pregnant. So James being a good, you know, Mormon boy, he comes back and he marries Sharon. Now, guess what guys? She was not pregnant. Mm -mm, she faked it. But, you know, what do you do whenever you're faking a pregnancy? Thankfully she didn't steal a baby, but she faked a miscarriage. But the damage was already done. They were already married at this point. Now, of course, they're, they've moved in together and James has gone back to school to try to finish and get his degree. And Sharon is working babysitting because, you know, at this point, she's like, what, 16 now? So she doesn't have any education. She doesn't have any experience. So she's babysitting now. Uh, throughout their marriage, they do end up having two children, a boy and a girl. And Sharon uh, gets bored of this life really, really quickly. In fact, she really starts to spend a lot. And James, he did get, he, he was educated, but he didn't make a ton of money. But she was spending it left and right. I mean, she spent her days shopping, okay? If she, if, thank God Amazon wasn't a thing whenever she was around because poor James would have been washing dishes at Amazon to try to make uh, the bills go away. So they start fighting over not finances and the marriage starts to become strained. At this point, Sharon starts to have an affair with a high school boyfriend named John. His last name is Bor Boriats. I'll put it on the screen because I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering it. Sorry. She starts to have an affair with him and James knows. So James is He's really contemplating divorcing her because, you know, spending habits are out of control. She is having an affair, but he goes and talks to his parents who are devout Mormons and they're like, no, you need to make this work. You need to make this work. So James is trying to make it work. It doesn't work. So he tells Sharon that um, on Monday morning, this is a Friday afternoon, Monday morning, he is filing for a divorce. I don't know why he told her ahead of time. That didn't seem like a smart plan, but he did. Like I said, it was, uh, well, I said it was a Friday. It was a Saturday when James told Sharon he was going to divorce her. Now, James lays down to take a nap, and Sharon takes their 22 caliber pistol and shoots him in the head. Yeah. So when the police come, Sharon tells them that their two-year-old daughter 
was the one that shot him in the head because James let their daughter play with the guns in the house and she knew how to handle a gun. So the little girl must have shot him in the head. They tried to do a fingerprint test on the gun, but the gun was actually really well oiled, so they couldn't get fingerprints. And my dog's barking, sorry. And of course, they didn't do a paraffin test to test for gunshot residue on Sharon or the little girl's hands. They really kind of took Sharon's word for it. And in fact, they gave the little girl a, um, this is gonna sound crazy, a 22 caliber pistol that wasn't loaded and she knew how to take the safety off and how to pull the trigger. So they just took Sharon's word for it. So they were like, okay, this was a horrible accident. Um, it is what it is. So Sharon buried her husband and collected the life insurance money. Now, <laughs> guess what she did? She went right out and bought a brand new Ford Thunderbird. And guess what? This crazy girl at this, uh, car dealership with for the Ford Thunderbird she meets Walter Jones now they meet and they kind of spark up this little connection right well she takes her car home she has it for a couple days and she decides she needs one with air conditioning so she brings it back to the dealership meets with Walter again trades it in for a new Ford Thunderbird with air conditioning uh, I kind of agree with you on that one sis anywho um, at this point, Walter is kind of smitten by Sharon because she's really pretty and she is very charming and they start an affair. Yes. Now, Sharon decides she wants Walter to be her next husband, right? Well, Walter's married, okay? And Walter does not want to leave his wife. He just, you know, wants to have an affair. So Sharon does her whole trick of, hey, I'm pregnant, you need to marry me. And he's like, no, I don't need to marry you. I don't wanna marry you, sorry, too bad. Let me get the outline on here because I'm drawing crooked and let me get the outline. Thanks guys, I had to uh, get that drawn on there so that I could get this show on the road because I was into it and one day I'll get this whole talking and painting thing together. <laughs> Two days after Sharon told Walter that she was pregnant and that he needed to marry her and that he said no, Walter's wife, Patricia Jones, goes missing. They cannot find her. Um, they said, or they, witnesses said that she had gotten into a car with a woman and she disappeared, essentially. Walter knew. He knew that Sharon had something to do with it. In fact, he went to Sharon, held a knife to her throat, and threatened her that I let my wife go, bring her back, tell me where she is, whatever he could try to do to get Patricia back. Sharon's like, I don't know. I don't know where, what's happening. Well, that night, Pat uh, I'm sorry, Sharon and old boy John that she was cheating on the first husband with, whom she's still having relationships with, okay? Her and John go searching for, searching for Patricia's body. Now, they go searching in the area where Sharon and John would go to like hook up, and guess what? John stumbles upon the body of a woman. Well, spoiler alert, it's Patricia. At this point, Sharon told John, um, hey, it's probably better if you tell the police that you found her by yourself. And he's like, okay, that's weird. So when he's questioned by police and they start to really press him, he caves and says Sharon was with him. Sharon told him to say that he was by himself, all that sort of stuff, right? At this point, they had enough evidence to arrest Sharon. In a twist of fate, Sharon actually was pregnant with Walter's child, so they had to delay the trial so that she could give birth. Now, she gives birth to their little girl. They end up um, having the trial. This whole trial hinged on the gun, the 22 caliber that killed Patricia, which Sharon said she had the 22 caliber, which was also the same gun that killed her husband, right, by her daughter. 
but she had lost it. Now the police in like a really extreme a detective work, I guess, they found the previous owner of that gun and talked to him. He told them he had done some test shots somewhere out in the country and that the slugs were still there. So the prosecutors, they halted the trial, they went and got the slugs and ran analysis on them. And it proved that the slugs they retrieved did not match the bullets from Patricia. So my question here is like, couldn't anybody have been out there test firing guns? Like where it seems like a chain of evidence sort of issue, but I'm not a prosecutor in the 1940s or 50s or whatever this happened. So Sharon was found not guilty and the courtroom rang out in applause. At this point, this pretty little um, housewife, no one believed that she could be the person responsible. After she was acquitted of the Patricia Jones murder, she was arrested and charged with the murder of her husband. At this point, the trial only took about three days and she was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Now, when the verdict was read, the courtroom rang out an applause again. So people have like a love-hate relationship with this woman, right? They love to hate her, I guess. There's people like that nowadays too. Uh, anywho, so she goes to jail and while she's in jail, she kind of like runs the show. She has a uh, relationship with a woman in jail. Uh, in fact, they, they get married, they get prison married and um, yeah, life's good for her in jail. She really is at the top of the food chain there. Now in 1963, Missouri overturned her conviction for, they, they said that the prosecution was, or I'm sorry, the defense wasn't given adequate time and, and preparation for the trial, which is a bunch of crap because they had, they were able to prepare, oh, well, maybe not for the husband, for Patricia they were, but okay. So anyway, she's granted a new trial. Ooh. The trial ended in March, 1964 in a mistrial. Crazy, right? A mistrial. Sharon is let out of jail to await basically the, her trial. So she is going for her third trial in June of 1964. And at this point, the prosecution shows letters from her prison wife saying, uh, please go to my grandmother's house and get the 22 caliber pistol that's hidden in the chimney. So the police are like, psyched. they're gonna find the gun that she lost, right? They go to the grandmother's house, they search it, do not find the gun. You know why they didn't find the gun? Grandmother had moved and they got the wrong address. At this point, can't you go to the old address? I, I mean, like, it just seems like some shoddy police work here, right? Um, John, her boyfriend throughout all the affairs and all the nonsense, all that, all, whatever, he testified that Sharon offered him a thousand dollars to kill her husband and then he later said what well, you know she could have been joking um her prison wife margaret testified that sharon oh sorry sharon confessed to killing her husband and patricia but guess what they go the jury goes to deliberate and it ends in a hung jury i mean what this girl has nine lives, at least. Her fourth trial is set for October, 1964. Again, she is allowed to remain out of jail while she awaits trial. And at this point, she starts to go a little wild. Uh, she starts to visit the mob scene on 12th Street in Kansas City. Now, whenever the police were doing their investigation, the mobsters really liked Sharon. They said that uh, she wasn't like a, a prostitute or anything, but she was like a, a girlfriend to the mob. I don't really know what that means, but she was like a girlfriend. They respected her because they knew she, could, she wouldn't talk. They respected her because they knew she would handle business. So this, these are the kind of people that Sharon is hanging out with. So just to give you an idea. Now her trial is set for October. And in June, she meets a man named Sam Pugliese. Pugliese? 
uh, whatever. Puddleys. And at this point, she marries him. Now, she seems to have an affinity for, like, handwritten marriages because that's what she did with her prison wife and that's what she did with Sam. So they decide to go to Mexico to just kind of lay down, lay down, or I guess lay down, lay low of the heat and escape, essentially. Once they get to Mexico, <laughs> they check into the hotel and uh, they get sick from all the traveling, right? They're like, don't drink the water in Mexico. Well, they probably drank the water. And Sharon is the first one to get better. And, and Sam stays in the hotel room. He feels like crap. So Sharon is like, I gotta get out of this room. She goes to a local bar and she meets up with a Mexican uh, native, Francisco Ordonzo. Again, I probably butchered that. Sorry, folks, it is what it is. Give me some French words. I can do that a little bit better. Probably not, but maybe a little bit better. Anyway, Francisco. So she takes Francisco back to his hotel room, or I should say he takes her, whatever. They kind of spend some time together, you know, spend some time together. And then Sharon shoots him with a 22 caliber pistol. I don't know where this chick is getting this 22 cal all these 22 caliber pistols because by this count, I mean, are we talking about two or three different 22 caliber pistols? Anyway, she tries to escape and the, uh, uh, the hotel manager kind of stops her. There's like a gate at the hotel. I, I, I don't know. I haven't been to any Mexican hotels lately. There's a gate at the hotel and Sharon is kind of stuck and the hotel manager won't let her out. So Sharon shoots at the hotel manager and hits her in the arm. But the hotel manager manages to keep her there, keep Sharon there until the police arrive. So the police arrest her and Sharon's saying that it was self-defense. She was going back to the hotel room to get medicine for her husband, Samuel, and that Frederick, I'm not Frederick, Francisco made unwanted sexual advances and so she shot it. Well, they were like, okay, maybe this is true, but they searched her. She had over 50 slugs in her purse. They went back to the hotel where Samuel was. They found more guns so they're like okay this was a robbery and uh it didn't go well <laughs> you know she got caught so she's arrested and she awaits trial for a year in mexico now at first she was like whining and crying saying that it wasn't good she didn't know spanish mexican jail was not fair not nice to her you know all all the things right well she ends up like running the mexican jail they the guards are afraid of her. The inmates are afraid of her. She runs a little store in the jail. Whenever she goes to trial after a year, she is found guilty of murder of Francisco and sentenced to 10 years in jail. 10 years, right? <sighs> this, this chick. So she is, is kind of pissed at this point because she's always gotten out of it. And she's like, I, I don't understand. Why am I getting... Being sentenced here so she appeals it and the Mexican prison system they ain't playing they said you know what you are unrepentant and you're costing us time and money you're now sentenced to 13 years in jail that's that's kind of I'm like yeah go Mexico <laughs> so Sharon goes to jail at um she's put into this prison I'm not even gonna pretend to pronounce it I tried and like pretty much bit my tongue trying to say it. So it's not going to happen. So she went to this prison, which is in one of the most intense and rough portions of Mexico City. And uh, <laughs> Sharon ran the place, you know. So Sharon's in there for about five years, uh, you know, living her best orange is the new black life. Let me look at this. Am I missing anything? I think I'm missing some little yellow up in here. Gotta have some details. So December 7th, 1969, Sharon Kinney disappears from the Mexican prison without a trace. She is there at roll call for bedtime, wakes up, well, we're assuming she woke up, get up in the morning, go do bed checks, she is not there. 
People have no clue where she went, what she's doing. They do have their suspicions though. Um, the greatest suspicion, well, one thinks that she died in prison and the prison just isn't really saying anything about it. But the main suspicion is that she found someone on the outside because, you know, anything you can count on, it's people found in love in jail, okay? Love, it, love after lockup, it happens. They say that she found um, a lonely, wealthy man and she was well liked by the guards or they were afraid of her. She escaped and was taken away by a wealthy, lonely man and for some reason people think she's in Guatemala. Now, Sharon Kenny today would be in her 80s and she would look like this, which <laughs> there's still a reward uh, in Kansas City. It's the longest standing murder warrant um, that in Kansas City history. So if you find her, you can turn her in for a reward, but they are never gonna find her. She looks like everybody's grandma. I don't know. She looks like a Sharon, not a Karen. Don't you think? Well, you see what I did there? So, did you guys find this case interesting? I was like, oh my gosh, this is intense, right? Uh, oh, her nickname, I forgot to tell you guys, is La Pistolera. I think I got it. It means like the female gunfighter. Uh, it's like, literal translation is like the gun holster, but in looking at it some more, you know, like the, there's a cultural translation, so it's like a female gunfighter. So that's really what that means. So what do you think? Do you think uh, she has more victims out there? Do you think she's too old and decrepit and couldn't care less? I don't know. I think she's still out there and I think she's probably scamming people. Who knows? So thanks for watching. I hope you learned something today and you found the painting interesting. I decided to do a sassy red dress. This is supposed to be a hanger. It's not deformed arms, but I wasn't paying attention. So my hanger got a little, a little it's okay. So anyway, until next time, guys, be kind to one another.